Welcome to Bayouk's webinar on energy communities on how we can protect, better protect consumers. We have a, hopefully a very interesting uh, agenda and session this morning. We get to share and discuss some of the issues around uh, these emerging um, and uh, innovative community projects that we see we see across Europe, increasingly so. And we are very pleased to welcome uh, in our panel this morning, uh, Monique Goyans, uh, Director General from Beuk, Josh Roberts, who will be with us momentarily, uh, who is Senior Policy Advisor at Rescoop uh, and has hands-on hands experience with, with energy community projects. Adela Tisharova, a head of unit from DG Ener, uh, specializing in consumers and retail market issues and Leonardo Meos, who is the director of the Florence School of Regulation. So we brought a, a very distinguished and varied group of energy experts with us today to discuss this very timely issue. It seems this week is a bit of an energy community week, and we can very well understand uh, the interest, um, particularly in the days we're living now, in these kinds of projects, these alternatives to uh, traditional suppliers, to traditional uh, generation and and what benefits um, they can bring to consumers, but also what what awareness, what risks, and what details people need to be aware of when they when they enter into these into these types of projects and communities. So, without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Jean Lufredo, who is uh, the energy team leader at Beuk, who's going to tell us a bit more about a very very recent uh, study that Beuk has been doing, uh, looking into consumer rights in, in the context of energy communities, especially uh, what they found and, and what can be improved in particular as we, as we go forward and as these grow. Jean, over to you. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Natalie, for, for the kind of introduction. And, uh, and again, also on my behalf, uh, thank, uh, well, welcome to all the participants and thanks uh, for joining. So I should have a presentation. Yes, here it is. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, we uh, commissioned this study, and if you can go to the next slide, yes, thanks. Uh, we commissioned this study because uh, we noticed that uh, uh, there is a growing interest across consumers across Europe uh, for uh, for energy communities. And the reason is, uh, well, the reason of uh, uh, participating to energy communities, the traditional reason, the historic reason has been the willingness of consumers, uh, of all consumers to actively participate in the energy transition. Uh, consumers, uh, many consumers want to, uh, want to support their government's uh, goals to uh, to cut uh, uh, to cut greenhouse gas emissions from, from the power generation sector for example and uh, uh, for this reason many installed uh, installed solar panels but many consumers don't have for example a roof where they can put a solar panel on because uh, uh, for example their tenants or because they live in multi-unit buildings still they want to uh, to contribute to uh, to the transition and investing in a community is uh, uh, is uh, a way for for them to do so, but uh, uh, the popularity of energy of energy communities increased recently after uh, the beginning of the of the conflict in uh, in Ukraine uh, because of the uh, of the energy price increase and uh, consumers have been searching for for ways for offers that could help them to uh, to find uh, uh, well to make uh, savings to save money on on their energy bills considering that their energy bills uh, skyrocketed uh, recently uh, can you go to the next slide um, so uh, for this reason, we commissioned a, a study to Profundo uh, because uh, uh, what we wanted to uh, to look into was whether consumers enjoyed uh, appropriate protections uh, when they joined an energy community. And the reason why we wanted to do that is because uh, uh, as a consumer organization, we have an interest in making um, well, in promoting ways for consumers to uh, to to engage in the energy transition and to contribute to the energy transition, but at the same time, we uh, we also want to make sure that uh, uh, those consumers who decide to contribute, they are also well protected. And this is important also also for the communities movement itself, because uh, the communities movement that you know, has been growing recently, if it wants to become mainstream, it needs to make sure that consumers can be uh, comfortable with uh, uh, in engaging with uh, uh, with energy communities so again it's important to to create a safe environment where where consumers can engage to have uh, tens of millions of consumers uh, uh, joining the movement 
So for this reason, we commissioned this study uh, where uh, we were looking into uh, some aspects that uh, in general are less uh, looked at. So all the issues related to consumer rights and to consumer protections and to consumer information. And if you can go to the next slide. Um, we found that uh, the, although um, consumer rights in principle are, are the same and consumer information in principle is the same, in some cases there are some, uh, some differences which uh, uh, depend to, uh, to, the, uh, to the business model of, uh, of the community itself. So um, we're not calling, of course, for uh, for same rights for different types of business models, but at least what we're calling for is uh, to uh, to make clear to consumers that uh, uh, that everything uh, you know where these uh, these things are are different and uh, explaining them uh, very well how what these entails. Uh, in terms of the findings, so we found uh, basically that there are six uh, areas where. Um, Basically, there, are, there is room for improvement. The first one, if you can move to the next slide, is the pre-contractual information. Um, as, as I mentioned before, in those cases in which, for example, the community uh, owns its own assets and uh, uh, requires, uh, uh, requires, requires uh, um, members of the community to invest in, uh, in the community, to buy, uh, to buy shares, to be able to access the, uh, the community itself, it should be made clear that, uh, uh, you know, it should make clear that there is this uh, sort of prerequisite, and this is different from uh, from uh, engaging with with a traditional a traditional supplier. And uh, um, basically, this information again should be made uh, visible in websites, which again sometimes they are they are not uh, as professional as the websites of the uh, let's say of former monopolies uh, in in energy, which again it's uh, it's normal because uh, the community movement is uh, uh, managed by by volunteers. Um, so there is probably a need to provide uh, to provide community community support through, for example, a standard or a code of, or a code of contact uh, of conduct uh, to make sure that these websites are more professionalized and that they are, uh, uh, let's say, more clear clear for the consumers. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is a requirement in the Liquidity Directive to uh, provide clear contractual uh, pre-contractual information uh, to consumers. And this obligation should apply as well to uh, to energy communities. And uh, uh, to our perspective, um, the the requirements existing legislation should further further improve. But I guess that this is uh, the um, this is part of uh, you know the top part of the topic of of a separate webinar. Uh, can you go to the next one? Um, price comparison tools uh, is another area where there is room for improvement. There are some cases where uh, com where energy communities uh, are featured in comparison tools, for example, in uh, in Belgium. Uh, in other countries, uh, uh, they are not. Um, the thing is, uh, most consumers look for new offers on price comparison tools. So if the communities are not present in uh, in those tools, then virtually uh, they are uh, impossible to find or they are much more difficult to find for uh, for energy consumers because, uh, you know, as I said, this is the tool that most consumers use to, uh, to, uh, to find a new energy offer. So it would be important that, uh, uh, that suppliers and energy communities provide up-to-date information to uh, well, to energy regulators or to, or to uh, other uh, organizations that uh, manage price comparison tools so that these offers are, uh, are made uh, public there. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, third point is about uh, uh, complaints and alternative dispute uh, resolutions. Um, there is uh, uh, there is a requirement in the legacy directive requiring suppliers to uh, sign up for uh, for alternative dispute res resolution schemes so that uh, when a controversy uh, arises uh, consumers can uh, try to find uh, uh, satisfaction outside of uh, of traditional uh, traditional courts um in energy communities, generally, uh, what we found is that when there is, when there are disputes, they are resolved. Uh, they are resolved internally. But what would be important again to uh, to provide better uh, better option to uh, 
well, a better option to uh, to solve uh, to solve disputes is uh, to uh, allow consumers to uh, to uh, to use an alternative dispute resolution scheme. So, to basically, uh, the community should be uh, should be uh, required to. Um, to have an uh, to sign up for an alternative dispute resolution scheme to provide this opportunity to uh, to consumers. If you can go to the next one, um, the the fourth point, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's one where uh, again, like what uh, uh, the relationship with, between the the consumer with the supplier and the relationship between the consumer with uh, uh, the the community uh, deviates uh, uh, deviate the most. As I was mentioning before, uh, in many cases, to be able to access. To, uh, to be able to access to an energy community, uh, consumers need to purchase uh, to purchase shares of uh, uh, of the community itself, um, and these uh, again uh, it might be a deterrent for some consumers to uh, to engage, particularly if they are not uh, very well aware about uh, uh, what uh, happens when they decide to leave the community. Basically, uh, when we, they will get the, their money back, when they will be able to to sell their shares. Again, this information should be uh, made uh, clear in pre-contraction pre information. And, uh, and the websites to uh, to make consumers more comfortable in uh, in engaging. Uh, there is also a, a an issue which is uh, a bit marginal but still uh, existing. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, the community also uh, is uh, uh, operates distribution uh, distribution networks, uh, whether uh, that is an electricity distribution network or whether that is uh, uh, that is a heat, uh, heat grid. And uh, uh, and here again, I mean uh, the um, the community has the same uh, obligation as, uh, as as the DSO. So it's important that uh, consumers are, uh, are reassured that uh, um, that uh, they will not lose access to energy, for example, if they cannot pay, uh, and uh, they are a vulnerable consumer. So they, it should be important that uh, to provide consumers that. Uh, um, the uh, the reassurances that they, they also have rights uh, uh, that the traditional rights apply also if, if they join if they join the community. Uh, next one. Um, customer service is another area where there is room for improvement. And again, we are fully conscious that uh, uh, communities are or are managed by uh, by volunteers in in many cases. Um, but uh, uh, what uh, we we noticed is that uh, um, when uh, consumers uh, uh, have a question, it often takes uh, longer for for a community to uh, to answer, or much longer for a community to answer compared to uh, a traditional supplier. Um, what uh, uh, would be important is to sort of professionalize customer service and to make sure that uh, uh, again consumers can have uh, uh, access to uh, well to um, that the consumers complaints or consumers questions are are responded uh, within a reasonable time frame and the last point um, is about data privacy and gdpr compliance um what we noticed is that in some cases um personal data from consumer from consumers example date of birth uh, address uh, are stored on uh, some uh, services or with some tools that are not necessarily in compliance with uh, uh, with uh, uh, gdpr and uh, here again, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of, uh, of identifying uh, of, of identifying those uh, those tools that are um, better that protect protect better consumer consumer privacy, uh, and to prioritize uh, those uh, those tools. Uh, I mean, to summarize, uh, all in all. Um, we feel that uh, again there is a lot of potential uh, for for consumers to join energy communities and we feel that uh, it is one of those tools that can help consumers to engage first time in energy consume in the energy in the energy transition but also to uh, to make savings uh, at the same time, we also feel that uh, uh, there is some some room for improvements when it comes to uh, certain areas of uh, uh, of uh, uh, consumer rights and consumer protection and consumer information. Um, this is not to uh, to sort of uh, complain about uh, bad behavior of energy communities. It's more like to uh, provide uh, uh, recommendations so that uh, uh, the community movement can you know further uh, flourish and that millions of, of consumers can. Can uh, can uh, can join the community movement, and we feel that if those things are done, um, consumers will have a safer environment, and more and more consumers will want to uh, to join the community movement. And uh, thanks a lot. And of course, if you have any questions, I'm here.
Hey, thank you very much, Sean. That's in, indeed very, very interesting, and I think very, very much to the point um, regarding the challenges um, of of these initiatives in terms of their, um, I guess, the balance that they have to find between the level of complexity and sophistication of the services and activities that they take on, and then uh, the, if you want, as you were saying, profit um, professionalization. Of, of the support and services that their that their members can can receive and expect, and and as we saw, uh, I think at the start of, in your slides, now there are a number of benefits. You know, wh whether they be financial, social, environmental, um, there's a range of benefits for for consumers uh, at different times, not only in times of crisis, and especially with the energy transition, we can only expect such initiatives to to grow and 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 hope so as well. Um, but indeed, it does then raise uh, the kind of issues of how can you reconcile the, if you will, the volunteer and the community spirit, the roots of these energy communities with uh, the directives and uh, the expectations of consumer rights and the quality of service, et cetera, and such an important essential service as, as energy. And, and this is very much what we will be discussing hopefully with our, with our panelists. Um, to get a sense as well from them, because we know energy communities come in all shapes and sizes, and there have been different experiences, and, and these consumer aspects are some of the most critical in terms of how to organize um, an energy community and ensure that uh, it's, uh, well, it's fit for, for a purpose and, and, and delivering consumers uh, the energy and, and the support that they expect. And, and maybe part of the solution is in terms of institutional administrative support that we should all be giving uh, to these volunteers to help them navigate <laughs> what is a very complex um, landscape of regulation, rules, etc. But uh, I'm just the moderator, so I will be passing the floor now to the actual panelists and because we want to hear what they think uh, and what they found uh, interesting from this study. Maybe I will start with Adela. If you can maybe give us just a first sense of, of what you took away from, from the findings in this bill of work. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think I should stop blur at my background. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I think this is a very, very timely study, a very timely topic. Um, and of course, as we have um, more and more diversity, as we will have more and more diversity on the retail energy market, hopefully, uh, with um, new ways of accessing energy or my, more diverse opportunity for consumers to access energy, um, we might be confronted with this question, potentially. And I think uh, there indeed might be issues. So I think this is very good that you are looking into it. Um, I would also like to say that, of course, if we discover that there is some potential loophole in energy legislation, there is we are not operating in a vacuum yet because there is always the general consumer framework which governs uh, you know, investments, rental contracts and these type of things. So there is some sort of alternative arrangement between um, within the energy community, which potentially could not fall under uh, the, the legal um, definition of supplier, for example, in the electricity directive, I think there is still, there is still the general uh, framework for protection of, of consumers um, beyond uh, outside the energy sector. So that would be one comment. Second comment is that I can indeed confirm that both the renewables directive and the electricity directive explicitly state that when people enter an, an, an energy community, they don't lose their rights of, of consumers within the scope of energy legislation. But I can imagine that there can be a situation where the energy community has a particular arrangement internally. And in fact, it's not a supply of energy, it's, it's, some, it's a sharing of own assets. And there could be a situation legally, I mean, we are look, looking into it ourselves as well, that maybe some of the provisions in, in the energy legislation would not apply. Uh, another comment I would like to make um, is that, um, uh, of course, there is also, um, for example, to appear in price comparison tools. Ob obviously, the energy community must be looking for new customers or new members, because if they are not looking for new members, it would also be misleading to consumers to uh, to advertise that there is an offer, there is a possibility to join an energy community which has uh, has a good price, a nice a green offer, but then the energy community is not open to uh, to accepting new customers. So. I think that also should be taken into account. We should not approach it mechanically. 
And another last comment, as we are still not, we have not fully implemented the electricity directive. So sometimes the reason might not be on the side of energy communities, but for example, if in a member state, we still don't have full independent and with the comprehensive coverage price comparison tool. So even if an energy community would like to feature there, they can't. So I think there are a lot of things uh, to be taken into account, but overall, I, I agree that this is a very topical uh, subject and very happy to be part of this seminar and learn more from the study. Thank you. <laughs> very, very, very well pointed out. Thanks for reminding us as well. The, the legal framework is there and we do have the, you know, the tools in place and now it's more a question of putting them into practice and, and finding the ways to make them effective in, 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 in the actual energy communities and for their members and consumers. So handing over now to Josh, uh, as we met, welcome Josh from Rescope, where they, they, they have some real experience here and they can tell us a little bit more vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the study and, and the findings that, uh, that they have discovered. Thanks, Natalie. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, first off, I think it's really good that Bayuk is focusing on this. Um, I mean, we we have, uh, you know, we were involved with some of their members and we did collaborate a little bit on the clean energy package. But, you know, for a long time, this wasn't necessarily a priority of theirs. So the fact that this study is uh, has been has been done, I think, is a good landmark in starting the conversation, because what I have always said and what Rescue BU has always said is at least when it comes to like a supplier or a service provider relationship, the energy communities are really customer owned entities. So it's by the customer for the customer. So, um, and Yao mentioned some of the key words uh, to make sure that this works, you know, making sure that consumers are comfortable, uh, that they're in a safe environment. I would be even more explicit in labeling this as trust Consumers need to trust that uh, that they are getting into this and that it works for them because ultimately, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why they're doing it and it's how they can take power. So, um, I mean, we also participated in the study to provide an overview of the activities that where where we have seen the the potential um, linkages with consumer rights. That was always in the the framework of what we were asking for in the clean energy package. Granted, that has caused some challenges. So, I'm also glad to see how we're looking at. How some of these rights are applied because indeed it's i mean we have a good example ecopower obviously they're probably one of our more professionalized members but when they were first starting um they just had set up the supply activities and i can't remember the exact number but dirk tells us that uh they had like 10 people uh all half of them were like volunteers and they had to onboard like five thousand customers in like one night because they just received an influx so i mean we, 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 like for us, rights <clears throat> our our whole, like the whole reason we can participate is, is, is based in consumer rights at the moment. So we want to make sure that that goes both ways. Um, but of course, we're talking about not like a traditional supplier consumer relationship. So we also have to understand on a more like personable level, how these work. Um, obviously I think the rules need to be there in place to make sure that there's nobody, uh, you know, sort of being lax and 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 not providing that that proper transparency or protection, um, but at the same time, I think it's it's a little bit more of a different process than you would traditionally think with like a, a traditional supplier. Um, so I, I I kind of want to uh, I want to highlight that one thing that I think is also important to look forward because this this meeting is about energy communities, but energy communities weren't the only concept in the in the clean energy package. You also have a lot of commercial initiatives that are probably not so interested in um, setting up energy communities, but they also want to bring consumers in. So I'm thinking more like um, collective self-consumption initiatives uh, that are run by more private operators. A lot of times the, 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 the distinction between these types of initiatives and an energy community initiatives, which gives the consumer more voice as a member and an investor, that's not always very clear either. So I think just to contextualize this in the broader uh, theme of consumer empowerment, I think that's really important because, <clears throat> I mean, by and large transparency, that is in the, the lifeblood and DNA of cooperatives, but it's not always clear what people are actually getting. So I think that's also, we need to make sure that they're, they're getting into it. I won't go into all the individual issues that were addressed in the report. I think we can leave that for the discussion. So that's my, that's my general, I'm, I'm really happy that you guys are doing this and I look forward to the the conversation that we'll have, not just today, but in the future. 
Excellent. Thanks very much, Josh. Indeed, there's there's a lot of rich material and a lot of different aspects to consider. And, and indeed, as you said, uh, the different types of models that are out there, the scale and the, the structure behind uh, collective self-consumption energy communities and the various definitions, all of which ultimately have to guarantee consumer rights and make sure that it is, is delivering um, <clears throat> everybody's trust and, and their basic uh, fundamental rights in terms of access to energy. So I'll hand over now to Leonardo because in the FSR just yesterday, there was a debate uh, on, on energy communities, but perhaps from the other side, more about uh, what are the rules uh, and the barriers to putting together a community. Um, and today we're focusing on once you have a community, you know, how do you deliver on, it, on the, the rights of those members? So they, they're very much complementary, these two sides. Of, of the energy community, how to, how to create one, and then how to keep one running uh, fairly uh, and in a trustworthy manner with, with its own members and, and beneficiaries. So no, no, no. what can you tell us uh, in terms of the findings from today's work? Well, first, thanks for inviting me because I'm always a pleasure to read your reports, but this kind of events are a good deadline to finally catch up with some reading. Um, and I, I guess there are two things to react in this report. First uh, is on the importance of communities. So I, I very much agree with what John said when this uh, framework was introduced in the clean energy package. I think it was very much about pub, you know improving public acceptance, engaging consumers. I, I think at that time, we had not expected that they would also become a major hedging tool, right? So that's what we discovered in this energy crisis when short-term prices were skyrocketing. All of a sudden, these community members were realizing they had a really neat protection against high market prices by jointly investing in the renewables, right? So that I think was a new discovery that it's not only about being part of a community, trying to push the transition forward, but that, that it can actually be a cheap way of, of receiving, uh, um, you know, uh, energy in general. So that's very interesting. That's also why there is more interest now in these energy communities. But then I also agree with book analysis that that sort of brings new responsibilities, right? Um, this growth indeed can also attract new communities. Um, if the existing ones cannot grow fast enough, new ones come, can enter. And then indeed, it's good that we are already talking about um, these kind of potential issues that can create before they actually happen, because I guess Joss was also relieved reading the report that it's not yet full of case studies of <laughs> bad behavior. So we can talk about it before it actually happens, right, and prevent it, uh, because I've been reading other book reports, and there it's full of case studies of bad behavior. Um, this report actually links to a report on suppliers from November, and I was really shocked reading all these case studies. Um, and I guess Yes, also for suppliers, it's very unfortunate because the supplier market is full of good companies behaving well, but then, you know, it's, it's enough to have a minority behaving very badly and it reflects on the whole community. Uh, and it also reminds me of a report of that book did in 2019. Uh, on flexibility providers, these new innovative companies where I really thought, oh, these are all great companies. They bring a lot of innovation. And then I read the report and that looked at all these contract clauses full of red flags. <laughs> and then I remember also very similar to what Joss just said, that it's often not intentional. Right. Also, these innovative companies were often companies set up with the best intentions. Uh, and then uh, we even had two of the CEOs of these companies joining the Burke event say, saying, you know, apologies, apologies, we've already changed our contracts, you know. So it also shows, right, that this is not always um, yeah, intentional bad behavior, but that these kind of new players need help, right? And I think um, this kind of book report can really help um, before um, we get into negative. So I very much welcome this. Uh... Great. Thank you very much, Leonardo. Indeed, as, as you're saying, it's sometimes it's just a question of, you know, they're all volunteers and they do not have an army of lawyers uh, who are able to navigate, interpret, and, and have the exact right wording with the commas in the right place to know all the clauses that they're supposed to make sure they have to comply with and respect all the rules. Um, some of that, we can certainly provide them with help, perhaps we even with standardized templates so they can you know, give them models of contracts that they can apply 
for the communities, things like this to help you embark on the, uh, on the adventure that is setting up an energy community, um, because it can also be quite, quite a, a challenge, not just an adventure. Once you start looking at all the, I won't say bureaucracy, but once you start looking at all the administrative aspects that go along with um, delivering energy to, to people. Right. Last but not least, I would like to ask Monique um, to give us her reaction as well. Obviously, uh, as our director general here, Rubeo maybe not react to, to the study, but what have what were your thoughts hearing our, our other panelists and, and how do you think, um, you know, this work has impacted or is going to impact uh, the, the discussion on energy communities, which is you know, not just starting today, but uh, a good launch pad from today? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, and and also uh, welcome to everybody to this conversation. Uh, reacting to uh, Leonardo, I just would like to give a disclaimer: we don't only do bad case studies; we also do the best practices. <laughs> just to say, we, we and what I also like very much in your in your intervention, uh, Leo, is that you said uh, that we are helping the market to improve. So we have sometimes a reputation of only asking for regulation, regulation, but sometimes by just flagging that there is a problem, the market players. At least the, the good, those who are well intentioned, they react and, and adapt their, their market, uh, their, their model or their, their contracts or their, their practices. Now, uh, coming back to your question, uh, Nathalie, um, in fact, um, why did we do this study first of all? Uh, because we know that energy uh, communities are part of the energy transition, but we wanted to do really a reality check. What's going on on the ground? How does this work? And <clears throat> I, I would say we were not really surprised but we found the results quite telling about the fact that in some markets, in some countries, there is quite a, a major and a professional uh, ecosystem, while in other countries, like in Central and Eastern Europe, it, they are just starting and there are still uh, quite a lot of um, difficulties there to overcome. What we have seen is a huge diversity in legislation applicable and a little bit a jungle. Um, Adela mentioned that there is general consumer legislation that might be the safety net in case. But uh, of course, it's quite difficult for a consumer to navigate among those different legislation that might be applicable. And you don't go to a lawyer for this type of thing. I mean, most of the people don't do that. So, um, and then uh, even if there is a legislation that is applicable and then that is understood, enforcement is the, is the next hurdle. So uh, we believe that this is really the right moment for us to be able to identify those barriers and to try as a consumer organization to, uh, to come up with recommendations in order to provide a safe uh, environment. Because as we would like to promote energy communities as part of the energy mix, if I can say so, or the energy offer mix. But that needs for us that a sustainable option, because we believe it's a sustainable option, must also be the safe option for consumers uh, in terms of their rights and their obligations. Very well. Very well said. Thank you very much, Monique. I think these are all important, uh, important points um, going forward. If I can maybe uh, open the debate up now between all of our panelists, um, take it to another level, as they say. Um, maybe coming back to Adela, we've heard a bit of here about enforcement, uh, consumer rights, good practice, bad practices, um, and also, in a way, the, the ability and the capability of energy communities to, to deliver on the consumer rights. And, and from the six recommendations um, in the study, we find some areas, you know, practical areas, in fact, which merit some, maybe some improvement and, and some more careful uh, insight and, and oversight. Um, I'm just wondering on that basis, and in the context that we, we're in right now, uh, European level, where there's a public consultation on a review of the electricity directive um, to improve the market design and, and the different aspects, and in particular consumer rights as well. Do you see that there's a, there's a need or an opportunity here to clarify any of our, of our legislation and the articles on, on these areas, um, which would help energy communities or, or make them more robust and trustworthy as uh, using some of the language we've heard already, and in particular, um, you know, the consumer rights aspects. Um, well, thank you for this question. Um, I mean, of course, there are a lot of things <laughs> uh, we can think about uh, in the context of the electricity market design review, uh, but the ongoing review of the electricity market design uh, um, is a quite uh, short-term project, um, kind of quick project, um, uh, which of course has um, uh, some some kind of key key questions to address. So I I, I, I cannot say whether you know how far uh, there, there's always improvements we can do, of course, um, but there will have to be a balance between uh, 
you know, what the commission can deliver in a very short time, for which we have enough analysis, and uh, what can also um, uh, kind of address the requests of the Open Council. Um, however, that said, if you look in the consultation document, um, we certainly raise some questions around sharing of energy. And uh, these questions, uh, of course, more broadly, sharing of energy more broadly as a wider concept and energy communities is one of those uh, examples of how we can uh, share energy. Um, and of course, in that context, the issue of consumer rights does come up, that's clear. Yeah, and I think the more alternative um, ways of engaging consumers or the more variety of ways of engaging consumers we cover in our legislation, the more we probably have to think also about the consumer rights because it's not the idea to provide diversity to consumers and kind of leak them away from the legislative framework. Uh, uh, that, that's clear. Um, so I think there are a lot of questions on the table for the electricity market design. And then we will see uh, how much uh, the college uh, can, can take up in a very short time frame. But I think we have learned a lot with the energy crisis and also uh, the kind of awakening of consumers to energy topics. Uh, it's certainly an opportunity to, yeah, we are learning a lot these days. And I think uh, uh, sooner or later we will have the possibility to, um, to maybe follow up on, on, on these things more legislatively. But I need to, again, repeat that we are not happy with the implementation of the electricity directive, and that's making a lot of things difficult, also for energy communities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the legal frameworks don't exist in member states, yeah, in many member states. Yeah, it can be slow getting off the ground. The rules are in place, but uh, getting them going in practice is a different story and uh, different experiences in different member states, for sure, have a major impact uh, on the ground. As you say so that's very very interesting and of course uh, we have uh, certainly not directly uh, related to energy communities but we see um, in the ongoing discussions on the revision of the gas directive we actually see quite some improvements being suggested for some of the basic consumer rights um, in terms of the information and in, in, in the contracts and things like this that that could be provided to consumers um, and our energy community members are also consumers so in some ways, some of those refinements that we see in the gas directive, which more about consumer rights than they are about gas, uh, might also be relevant for, you know, for our discussion here and further down the line in terms of the practical um, trust and information tools that uh, consumers can can rely on. So, just going back to to the issues in the in the actual study, uh, Josh, um, the study mentions the issue about websites, transparency, information that uh, communities share uh, with new members or, or current members. Um, do you have any kind of good practice now, uh, good practice examples uh, on this area that might be relevant as well? Yeah, I do. Uh, maybe I can mention just one example because uh, you guys already mentioned earlier that some, you know, I'm really mainly focusing on suppliers. I can touch on production too, because that's probably a larger part of our activities. But when it comes to supply, we talked about some cooperatives not being able to offer new membership. Um, that is for very specific regions. Mainly it's because of the uh, the business model that, that, that uh, energy cooperatives employ, which is basically to uh, meet the consumption of its members. So if it doesn't have enough production to meet the consumption, it's just buying from the wholesale market and it's not providing any added value. So one of the things I was actually looking at before this EcoPower uh, in Flanders, um, they actually had to stop accepting members because of the energy crisis. Um, and I just checked their website. They they still say this. It's it, When you click there, you see it automatically, but you also see that this should uh, change in summer of 2023 because they have a new wind turbine coming on. Um, I also looked at my own cooperative supplier, uh, Cositer, which is in Wallonia. There's a big red box in there that says, sorry, we're not uh, accepting new customers. Unfortunately, they don't say when they will be able to. So, I mean, that's not their fault, clearly. But um, so I think I think those are good ways that people can just provide information up front. Um, I mean, I think I think generally speaking, it's probably too broad to make a general statement. But I think those are some good we can look at the more professionalized members and probably take some good examples from them. That's usually how energy cooperatives operate generally. 
where you have the more advanced ones and the, the younger ones are coming in and they're learning from them. That's, that is a very strong part of how we operate and our members operate. Um, so, and I mean, on the more active side though, there are some really good examples. Uh, I can mention EcoPower again, but uh, Enercop and some of our, uh, and um, some Anarchia in Spain, they have these sort of like energy cafes or uh, in Enercop it's called Le Village. And it's basically a platform where members can come um, one of the one of the operating principles of cooperatives is education and training of the members so that they can take part in the activities of the cooperative, but also impact their communities more uh, and take more uh, responsibility for themselves. And so there's a lot of uh, there's a strong outreach element in educating people, providing them with services, uh, whether it's home renovations or figuring out how to save energy. Um, and some of those are more like workshop based. So they're actually going into the communities, but then there's usually an online platform where people can come and talk about issues. They can raise issues with internally within the cooperative um, or just learn about certain things. I think these have been very valuable in the energy crisis where people have been exchanging information with each other about what they can do uh, to make their situation better. So uh, I think I think these are some um, yeah these are some really good uh, examples but uh, yeah um, it's uh, that's that's kind of I think that's kind of where we're at at the at the moment. Okay, that's really interesting. You know, the idea of a the community offering really community uh, service and dialogue and and exchange, not just uh, delivering a product, but also helping helping yeah. each other with managing that product. Yeah, maybe maybe one thing I would also mention though that has been a challenge. It's not something we've really looked at, but I understand that in the uh, energy crisis, um, because governments have been changing a lot of things, mm -hmm. uh, the, the suppliers also have an obligation to inform the customers. That's not necessarily a problem, but with uh, just with the way they operate, it it is more of a challenge. So that's also something I think we need to to consider is that they want to be transparent as possible, but also in this environment, they might need a little bit of assistance because it's, uh, they're also losing members because uh, some of them have to raise their prices. And I, I, I heard from our member in Spain that uh, a lot of the utilities there are still like sort of, they're technically unbundled, but not really effectively. And so they've been able to trade uh, PPAs with each other internally and then they can uh, they can they can artificially lower their prices. So, in in one sense, the communities are unable to react. So uh, we have to be really careful about how we are addressing the energy crisis and how that impacts their continued ability to provide uh, uh, proper services to their members, um, because mm -hmm. this is already a challenge for them. Right, right. No, that's also very important. I mean, it, it, there is a commitment in, in joining or investing in an energy community, which is a medium long term uh, commitment. You, I mean, some stability in terms of what it's going to cost you, but it's not necessarily zero cost. And, and maybe there's also some expectation management uh, in terms of what it means to, to join an energy community. People may think it's a, it's a free ride. Um, but uh, sometimes it will be cheaper than the market and other times it won't be cheaper than the market. Um, but it's in the knowledge that you're, you've got a longer term um, visibility on where you're going and, and the community, you know, ethos and an outcome, whether it's environmental or security of supply or, or the various different motivations that bring people into an energy community. So I mean, that's also an important uh, reality check, as we were saying earlier. Right. Um, you mentioned something about uh, consumers kind of selling out, I mean, communities selling out uh, and having them to go to the market, to the spot market. And so that brings us to the issue of prices and costs that we were just now referring to. And I wonder, Leonardo, um, we haven't really talked about it yet, and I'm not sure if it's mentioned, uh, in fact, in the study, it's not really the focus. So have we seen um, or in practice some monetary benefits, as they say, for consumers who are involved in energy communities? Do we see a big emergence now? Uh, we, we've talked about some of the, uh, Josh mentioned at least a couple of examples where uh, they've had to alert on their website that you know, they are sold out and for now they're not, they're not able to, to sell any more membership you know, entry. Um, what does that mean? Is it because the price is, is so good? Uh, is it the benefits or is it the crisis? And, and do you have any insights on this? Well, we didn't have um, 
a big study or anything on that, but uh, I have the same anecdotal examples as Josh. Even me as a citizen in Belgium, I had the same reaction. And I found out indeed on that website that they were not accepting members anymore. And I saw this morning indeed the same announcement uh, that this summer I might finally have a chance to, to become a member. And I guess there is a big difference between energy citizen energy communities and then these renewable energy communities, right? So I guess it's mainly that hedge that has a certain delay uh, that you cannot just accept new members until you have the time to invest in new renewable projects. And then as long as these communities rely mainly on local projects, right, smaller ones, yeah, they, ha they have that constraint. Um, um, that's normal. Uh, then I think it also opens the question on how can we help um, communities uh, to invest more and should we promote more the possibility of citizen participation in bigger projects right that has also already been a discussion topic i think coming from the energy communities uh, but at least in 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 some countries that has also been discussed by government because i agree with adela we are behind in implementation but there are already a few countries that are a bit um, leaders right and that have already even considered this citizen participation in, in bigger tenders and then they can accept of course more uh yeah more members i think it's also interesting to see how the current consultation that adela already referred to on the electricity market reform so first i i welcome very much that this uh, topic of communities is in there um and as Josh said it's framed broader Right, it's about energy sharing, and that can be done in multiple ways. So it's, I think, very good that the consultation sort of implicitly acknowledges that by also saying, does that then mean that we have to go a step forward in this energy sharing um, as part of the solution uh, to this crisis? Um, I think, at least my personal view is that definitely that's the case. Huh? Um, but yeah, how much do we need a new framework? How much do we just need to implement the current framework? Uh, I think it would also be nice to hear from Joss what he thinks about it. But I, I guess one aspect of the current framework is that we have these different concepts, citizen energy community, renewable energy community. Do we see it maybe as an opportunity to, I don't know, to simplify it a bit or, right? Um, uh, yeah, and will that help then also the implementation maybe at member state level. Um, I think that should be part of the conversation. And also part of the conversation should be how we link whatever we will do there with what we might do on other topics like these long-term contracts, right? PPA, if, if there is going to be a new framework to encourage either private players to do these kind of contracts or having more government involved, how does that then connect to this innovation? Because you would not want that governments would step in to protect consumers while not ignoring you know and ign and by doing that maybe ignoring what communities could do for instance or other innovative players could do so how can that be a win-win between these two rather than a conflict i think that's also really important um, going forward and i hope that will also be in in the consultation and what happens next uh, with the proposals uh. Very good. Well, that's um, a panelist answering questions by giving us a lot more questions. Um, but just, I think, uh, very, very, <laughs> very much to the point and very much on, on target, um, these kind of issues and how, how can we really make them work, uh, given all the different kinds of models. Um, going back maybe to something that we discussed in an event with the FSR yesterday, um, Adela mentioned the importance of, of access for vulnerable consumers for the energy poor to community projects and different kinds of initiatives so that they can also benefit. Um, and I think that is part of the issue in terms of the scale that different participants, municipalities, mixed projects, which bring in public buildings or, or et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's also an aspect that um, comes into play here. Uh, and it answers, it doesn't answer, but it's related to one of your questions of, you know, what's the right size? Um, if it's very professional, so they can handle all of the different uh, aspects and requirements, it has um, some benefits, but uh, it's, is it the only way forward and, and different configurations are certainly possible, but they can, they can have uh, different results and reach different people. So I think that's also uh, an important thing to, to keep in the back of our minds. Now, just um, maybe now moving to, to another aspect in the, in the study, um, we talk about 
the study re refers to potential barriers if you try to leave an energy community and what your options are um, in those situations. I don't know, Monique, if you want to to um, share with us a little bit your views on, on this challenge, um, because we have our rights, we join a community, we change our mind, and then what happens? Mm -hmm. I think that the most uh, specific barrier uh, that I really would like to highlight, and it's a little bit already a question, uh, an answer to the first question that was put in the q and it's the business model. In fact, uh, um, the business model of energy communities is mostly based on the fact that you are not just a, a customer, a client, you are an investor and you pay a share uh, or you, you buy a share. Uh, and that's okay. So th the business model is not the problem. What is the problem is that the consumer is not necessarily aware of that aware of the potential. I mean, he has a different relationship with the community than if he would only be a client. And that might then, of course, um, uh, hinder the, uh, the mobility of the consumer. He will not be, they will not be able to switch easily uh, uh, suppliers, uh, which is normal because in an energy community, we are not talking about having a share in Google or in Microsoft. They have millions of, or billions of shares. Here it's more small, small scale project. So if somebody takes away their initial investment, it can also uh, hinder the, let's say, the, the, the sustainability of the investments of the community. So we believe it's fair that the business model um, asks for initial investments and protects those investments against taking them back too quickly, but the consumers need to meet, be made aware of it. And this is really, I think uh, Adela also mentioned it, it's really important to, well, I don't like the word educate, but just to explain very clearly, what's the difference between an energy community and just taking out a contract with a traditional uh, supplier? And, and this is very important because then uh, there are plenty of people who are not afraid of not switching, uh, if, if that's OK. Uh, um, but just they need to know so that you, first of all, you prevent frustrations. Uh, you also provide consumers with uh, reassurance that they know uh, where they put their foot in. Uh, and you prevent disputes at the end of the day. So I believe that if you can address uh, the transparency of the business model and um, have it maybe maybe uh, to provide assistance to the smaller communities to have a template, it can be done in a template way. Huh? Uh, the explanation can be really uh, a totally standard. Uh, it would be really a, 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 a crucial help for the take up by consumers of, the, uh, of this model. Yeah, I think that's critical. I just going. I was visualizing the websites that Josh was telling us with the big alerts, <laughs> telling you what are the conditions. You know, when you sign up here, what is it actually signing up for? Um, and uh, certainly that transparency and the knowing the rules of the game and really what your commitment is and and what the rules are if you if, if and when you decide you want to try something else. Mm -hmm. I think that needs to be upfront and large print um, in your contract uh, and explaining to consumers. Uh, exactly what it is that they're signing up for. So I don't know, Josh, if you want to, to react to that briefly since Monique. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, as a consumer myself, uh, I always get pissed off when I miss certain things and it prevents me from doing what I want. So I I, I can't express anything but 100% uh, agreement with Monique. I don't think it's, but I don't think that's the question. I think it's the question of how we actually achieve that. So, I mean, I think that's that's where the interesting part of the conversation starts. And I think that's, again, that's where the report stops starts. I think uh, it's probably a mix of like a conversation with energy communities uh, and, and even Bayouk. And I would even urge, Natalie, uh, the regulators also need to be a part of this. Um, I know some member states have already, within sort of the one-stop shops that they have, they provide, sometimes they provide template contracts uh, that communities can use, not just to... Uh, enter into agreements with their own members, but also with other uh, actors in the energy system, like the DSO. Um, one note on that, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, is that uh, we, it's already been mentioned that a lot of, of the legislation hasn't been very well transposed or that the details are lacking. One big fear that I have is that the regulators have been given most of the details. I, I use a Romania as a good example where they basically copied and pasted the EU legislation, but all the details are supposed to be filled in by the regulator. So I worry that that is something that uh, they will also have a challenge with. So it's something that we really need uh, to take seriously. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't argue with the essence of what Monique has said. I, I fully agree. 
No, absolutely. Um, the regulation and in particular the contractual uh, relationships uh, between, you know, the business to business, if you will, the, the system yeah. relationships and the consumer relationships, yeah. they're, they're critical. There's, there's actually also, sorry, I, I should mention something else. It's on energy, energy sharing specifically. And this is something that is, it's not included in the EU legislation. And it wasn't something that our, our members had really integrated, but that is the, uh, the role of a community manager. Um, and this is often like, it's hard to understand what this actually is because it kind of differs and it's in some member states legislation and not. So I think we really need to look at this and what they actually do. But uh, basically, they are also kind of like a representative mm -hmm. uh, by the community to sort of sign off on agreements with them, to sort of submit them to like the DSO and to interact on their behalf. Because again, a lot of people don't want to be actively involved. So that also raises questions about how much tr how much of a role that they have and, and what the scope of their ability to speak on behalf of the community and what happens if, if that relationship disintegrates. I think that's kind of more like, a, and this, by the way, doesn't relate just to energy communities. If we are going to have other uh, enterprises that are enabling energy sharing and they're using this, it's something that we really need to pay close attention to because it can ease the burden of, mm -hmm. of uh, citizens trying to participate, but it could also create some problems, so. Yeah. Oh, indeed, I think um, now wearing my Portuguese hat, uh, we do have the figure of a representative in our legislation for energy communities. So they do have specific tasks uh, to take on on behalf of, the, of their communities to make sure that they navigate all of these different arrangements that have to be put in place uh, when you're running it, either as a supplier or as a producer or all the different, uh, the back office that really is necessary for, for all of these things to work uh, in practice. So maybe just jumping back, uh, still thinking about the energy poverty and the energy poor and, and their potential involvement. And I wanted to maybe pick on Adela since uh, this is something I know that the European Commission is, is very concerned about. If, if you, going beyond what's in the study that we're looking at today, if you have, um, do you see any barriers or, or, or even any recommendations uh, and how we can really ensure that these type of community projects can be accessible to, to different, uh, I, say, I was gonna say communities, but to the energy poor, to the vulnerable, and if there's um, any practices or best practices, even we can say that, uh, that you've come across uh, in, in the work that you've been doing recently. Well, thank you. Um, well, I must say we, we don't have um, much analysis uh, at this stage. I know Rescoop is looking into this question, actually. So uh, they might have uh, some concrete findings, but on our, uh, we are certainly interested in this topic uh, because we think that the concept of energy community is kind of very well suited to involve people of different income levels because there has these environmental, social objectives, nonprofit uh, aspects. So, it is a very nice concept that brings people together and hence can bring people of different incomes uh, together. So it's something we would like to very much encourage. Um, from what I have seen, uh, also more kind of anecdotal examples, uh, very often a municipality is a good uh, interlocutor to bring uh, uh, these people together because they can maybe help them with the uh, entrance fee or they can, uh, you know, um, make it yeah uh, basically they can support people who would not be able to afford the entrance fee otherwise um, we had a very nice presentation by um by a mayor from from a flemish town eclo i think and they there had this wind farm and they they make it at the disposal of everyone in the town and uh, and of low income people in particular so i think there are very nice uh, best practices there or good practices there and i think we Certainly, we in the GNR, we very very keen to learn more about it and maybe help to disseminate these good practices. I said, then it's an area with a lot of potential. Yeah, very good. That's really interesting. And maybe the next study will be looking into more examples of how these things can be made accessible uh, across, um, you know, our, our society. So finding different ways and different um, tools, um, whether so they don't have to necessarily pay an investment fee themselves. Uh, which can be the first barrier, uh, obviously, in certain circumstances. So um, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, and I thought if if you all agree, we have a couple of questions in the chat, we could jump directly, make sure we have time to, to discuss as well some of the very interesting questions we've had 
um, from some of our participants. I think um, we have here a first question, which uh, Adela, uh, I think you you already mentioned briefly, but um, yes, indeed, today's event is mostly about the, the rights of the members. And there's an interesting question here about switching energy communities. And that is something that is addressed uh, in the study. I don't know if, if uh, Beuk uh, wants to comment directly or if, if through Josh if, or any of you, you have any experience on the situation switching and, and knowing your rights if, if you do want to, aside from the, the responsibility, the contractual arrangements of the investment and, and the business model, um, how, is it possible and how, how is that being, if you will, um, respected in practice? Should I take the floor, Natalie? Yes, Monique, please. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know where, uh, how we have to, I mean, I, I just wanted to say, I already mentioned it very shortly in the previous uh, intervention, but it is the fact that they might lose their in, in initial investment that will prevent people from switching. And uh, for, in our view, maybe Josh has, has more experience on that, but that's where we think is the main barrier for them switching because they might lose their, their stakes there. Yeah, I mean, for, for, from my perspective, I mean, I kind of have a, it, you almost have to be more precise with the question of what you're asking, mm -hmm. um, because as I said, like energy communities do a lot of things. So and it's going to depend on the activity. So if you're looking at renewables production, I mean, you're an investor, you, you don't have a consumer relationship unless you're being supplied or provided a service. So it's an investor relationship between the community and the individual. And uh normally uh, people should be able to invest in as many projects as they want. So it's not even a matter of switching. It's a matter of being able to participate in different initiatives. Um, I know that in Austria, there's kind of an issue about being able to participate in more than one energy community. For instance, if you have like multiple households or something, um, you know, across the country, maybe you want to set up different energy communities that revolve around those households. You might not be able to do that. When it comes to switching for like a supplier or service provider, I have to say that in my personal opinion, this the issue is kind of theoretical because you're not often going to be able to find multiple like cooperative suppliers. Uh, and uh, but I mean, as far as that is concerned, yeah, you're it's you're going to uh, you're going to uh, face the same issue that you would if you're just uh, changing a, a traditional supplier. I did I do know that uh, district heating was kind of mentioned. Um, you can't switch your DSO. You can't switch your system operator. So for me, that's that's more of a like you can you might be able to leave and and in any case you know all your consumer rights uh, apply. So but I guess the question was around the investment. Yeah, I mean, that's probably something that needs to be to be more looked into. Again, that's part of the investor relationship. Uh, I was talking with uh, Inostra, our, our Italian supplier, and basically you invest uh, 200 euros to become a member of the cooperative. You can, if you leave, you can leave uh, as a customer, but that investment stays in the cooperative for 12 years. So I don't know if a 200 euro investment, you're still going to receive a return on investment every year from that. I don't know if that's going to deter you uh, from from switching from that, but like I said, there's not another energy community supplier in in Italy at the moment. You're going to be switching to a non-community supplier, so that we probably need more like detailed uh, questions and like surveys to 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 figure that one out. But that would be my answer. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting practical example. It, it may depend on the level of the. Is it where the deposit that you put down that's non-refundable yeah. or that just takes a long time yeah. to be refunded? Um, also, sorry, I mean, the, the, the level of investment always differs. I know there was a cooperative here where it, it would cost like a thousand euros to become a member. I didn't, I, I could still be supplied, but I didn't become a member because for me that was too much. So, and I know that some, you know, there are actually some uh, initiatives that you can become a member for like one euro or 50 euros. So that is actually like, that's probably also something that cooperatives need to internalize as well or energy communities is that it doesn't always have to be high. If you want more inclusion, uh, mm -hmm. then just set the price lower. Yeah, maybe there's that perception 
uh, that needs to be tackled. So it's all, again, a question of communication, transparency, information, and, and helping people realize it's, it's not necessarily, I'm gonna have to pay for a bunch of solar panels, it's too expensive for me, I can't even get in. Uh, so that's really quite useful. Um, uh, you know, and, and many of us may have been under under those misapprehensions uh, and still would be out, out there. Um, we have another interesting question, um, a parallel with the construction center um, where there's some kind of concern that this the use of cooperatives or communities is a way to get around rules and obligations. I, I think today's discussion is very much showing that that's not the intention um, in the energy framework, but there's a question here about ADR, what could the role of an ADR be? I'm not sure I quite understand, um, but can the ADR investigate if rules are being uh, interpreted elastically, I think maybe is the question. And what can the role of the ADR be? I don't know if, if, if Adela uh, wants to jump in on this one, but um, our ADR framework at European level is, is quite uh, specific in terms of its, of its tasks and, and powers, uh, mainly directed at resolving direct disputes. I don't know if there's any. Well, we have a more advanced ADR framework in energy legislation than is the general one at EU level. And so here, uh, suppliers are obliged uh, to, to join um, the mechanism. Then to the extent the energy community, I guess, is a supplier, then uh, they would, uh, um, yeah, they would be required to join. Um, but they have to be at the act of sale, right? For someone to be a supplier, you have to be selling electricity. So if you are sharing it between investors, if you have a small energy community where people invest, then they probably might not. Uh, but okay, here we are entering into the legal analysis, which is something we are looking into it in, in the team. Um, so, but you have always the less advanced but existing Europe, uh, ADR framework for all other cases, right? Outside energy, which still applies. But I think there are better experts on this, like Monique, so, or maybe Josh, so I will stop here. <laughs> If I could maybe just um, add something there. Um, uh, I'm not an expert in construction, <laughs> but uh, I would um, guess that the energy uh, uh, regulatory framework is much more dense uh, than the construction framework. Uh, so the legislation would anyway apply. And I don't, I don't think that, at, at least to, to some extent, and we know that there is a piecemeal approach and that it needs maybe to be harmonized and enforced, but still, uh, uh, I think that circumvention would be more complicated in the energy sector than in the construction sector. And of course, ADI, uh, if the provider or the community or the managers of the community uh, uh, need to participate to the ADR system, then I think the ADR uh, can investigate this type of, uh, has the power uh, to investigate this type of things because it is being done in a, in a non-judicial way. So it's, it's about discussing between the parties. So I would be quite uh, positive about uh, the fact that this can be prevented uh, as, a, as a similar situation as the one that Laura uh, described in her question. Yeah, thanks. And I, just a, an anecdote on the Portuguese level, we are not a full ADR at the regulator, but we are a dispute resolution um, body. And indeed, when we get individual cases, you know, between a supplier and a consumer, if we see an issue um, we then can use that to investigate and potentially fine uh, and even change our rules to make sure that, that that kind of behavior isn't possible for other suppliers ever again. So we do have um, one thing is the individual case and the other thing is evidence that comes out of these kinds of complaints or, or disputes that can then be used to improve um, the regulatory framework and the rule book and also to to fine uh, any any suppliers or any market actors who, who seem to be if you will, um, following bad practices and, and, and misleading behavior. So I think that's important, and not just for energy communities, for, for all of the energy sector. Uh, Josh, you wanted to jump in? Sure, yeah. On, on the ADR issue, all I would say is, I, I would probably just add a word of caution. I don't think we have enough experience on this to really fully understand what is needed. But I would say that a lot of cooperatives um, uh, required by their own national legislation are required to have internal dispute resolution mechanisms. So we need to account for that. And we also need to be wary that ADR, I know it's tr traditionally been kind of, I don't know who has the, the better resources at hand in those processes, but 
we should also make sure that we, you know, if if the cooperatives can handle it internally, um, we should probably try to rely on that. Um, maybe ADR can be like a backup to make sure that it's a fail safe. Uh, but we should we also like this is where I would caution like we should try to not be too formalistic from the beginning because we could be adding unnecessary uh, barriers or costs uh, to the suppliers that could prevent them from actually doing what they need to do. So that's all I would say. Um, the jury's still out in my mind. Uh, on the on the abuse thing, I would also switch this back. It's not just cooperative models that are used to circumvent certain rules. This is is the case. I don't want to hide behind this, uh, and I don't want to hide behind the fact that it's not happening in the energy community sphere, uh, especially for renewable energy communities. Um, they do provide some certain incentives, uh, either in terms of regulation or feed-in tariffs or stuff like that. So we do need to be aware, and I think this is where the regulator's role uh, becomes very important in ensuring that uh, traditional market actors are not using energy community labels uh, to uh, citizen wash, uh, <laughs> I will say. Um, yeah, basically, you know, using the energy community label to get benefits, but not really, and, and not really giving citizens what they think they're actually getting. Um, Again, this is all about ensuring trust, um, and especially in Eastern European member states where there is not a, a consensus or un a great understanding of what energy communities are, we could see uh, a lot of problems. So it should be it should be kind of on the radars um, from the beginning. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, the rule book is there. We just need to enforce and make sure there, there's proper oversight on the activities of all the different types of uh, suppliers or communities or or energy providers. Very good. Um, I'm just looking at the clock. We still have some really interesting um, points and questions. I think some of them we have discussed in terms of how we can support uh, energy communities to be more professional and um, different tools that, that can be provided. Um, we mentioned some templates, so one-stop shop services that can help guide um, new energy community projects in, into, the, into the administrative uh, requirements and rules that they have to respect. Um, transparency issues, reaching out to consumers to explain how they work, um, what they cost, uh, what the conditions are of, of becoming a member, etc. Um, I think a very interesting case here from uh, Bulgaria as well, um, raising the issues and the challenges there, which very much depend on the, the market situation, the context in each country. Um, what are the prices? What is the energy mix? Uh, what is the market situation? And, and how can, can such communities be promoted and, and rolled out uh, given these different circumstances and realities that we have in our different countries. And I think that's also very, very uh, important uh, consideration for all of us. Um, so I, I'm afraid we might not have time to, to go into all of these, but I, I did want to just bring them to all of our attention because I think they, they very much hit the hit, you know, the nail on the head in, in terms of, of, of the reality on the ground and the things that we should, we all need to be thinking about going forward. But just before we close, um, maybe one last question to, to each of the panelists, like a one flash answer if you have if you have a moment um, to give us what your you know <laughs> what your thinking would be if you had a, a magic uh, you know magic ball. Uh, where do you see the energy market? 10 years from now and what does it look like for you and, and how much citizen participation is there really um, 10 years from now? Maybe just a quick a quick reaction from each of you. Maybe starting with Monique. Um, thank you. Well, uh, uh, consumers will engage more and more into energy. While it, a few years ago, it was still boring to read your energy contract. Now people are buying renewable energy. People are going into demand response. People are considering energy communities. We believe it's the sustainable energy community is part of the sustainable uh, sustainable future of the energy market. But in order to take uh, to promote consumer take up, you really need to make it easy for the consumer. That means it must be made more visible. Uh, meaning, uh, as far as possible, um, energy community proposals should be part of price comparison tools. And I, I, I heard Adela; she said. Uh, uh, it is sometimes difficult, but it can be managed. You can take them off when they are uh, closed to, to new customers. You can also limit that geographical scope. It has happened in Flanders and in, in Brussels already. I mean, just to give the two examples I know best. 
And I would also call on energy communities, not just to wait for customers to come to them, but to also go there where customers are, social media, more outreach, in order to create some sort of a, you know, like a, a um, awareness uh, in, in the market that this exists and that this is a good solution that can also be supported, for example, by the regulators huh? as, a, as, a, as an alternative. Okay, jumping maybe to Josh. Sure. Um, I'm going to split this into two things because, I mean, we are at a Bayouk uh, event, so we are focusing on the consumer. I would also like to step back and place this in context of the citizen uh, and the local citizen, because uh, in the context of the, the energy crisis, we are talking about uh, an unprecedented scale of needing to invest in renewables. I think the investment in local areas needs to prioritize local ownership, not just by energy communities, not just by individuals, but also local authorities. And I think that we, 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 we made a headway in the clean energy package on ensuring consumers are empowered in the energy transition. But I think in the next market design, we also need to focus more on making sure that local community actors uh, can, can prioritize ownership, not just of production, but also supply. And that gets me to the consumer part. I think uh, in 10 years, it really depends on what we are able to accomplish uh, on a policy level, both at EU level and the national level in the next five years. Right now, uh, we've been talking a lot about suppliers. The fact is there's no new supplier coming into the market that is an energy community today. Uh, you either need to have uh, enough renewables production or uh, some other means to, to balance all of the obligations and uh, I mean, there's also questions in the consultation design around hedging. Um, most energy communities hedge through their production. They're not big enough and they don't have sufficient financial resources to uh, to to um, comply with the requirements for like guarantees or even guarantees required to hedge on forward markets. So we need to understand this. We need to make sure that what's coming out isn't hindering the models one of the best models that we actually have. And I, I think consumer rights, we probably don't need to change much, but we definitely need to address how we regulate uh, supply utilities because the cooperative model, it is not commercial. The investment expectations are completely different. So if we want them to be able to participate in the market, we need to make sure that the, the regulatory framework for those activities and the responsibilities they actually have to undertake are proportionate uh, to, to all of these factors. So. I think that is kind of a big blind spot right now. The clean energy package does provide some basis, but we, we really need to push that forward. Um, so I think, uh, and and again, I think clarity, uh, Leonardo mentioned it, uh, the CEC, REC distinction. I'm not saying we don't need both definitions, but I, I do think if it's going to last in the long term, we need to clarify it a little bit. So perhaps the, the, the market design presents an opportunity to do that. But yeah, I'll leave it there, thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, Leonardo, just a quick flash view of the future. Yes. So I, I think if you look back, it's amazing where we are today, because I started in this sector 20 years ago in an engineering department where we talked about the demand side as load. We already thought it was quite, you know, a, a progress to talk about consumers. Then I joined the business school where they said they're not consumers, they're customers. And then I met Jos and he said, they're not customers, they're citizens, and we need to engage them. <laughs> So that's a big change, right? So if I then look forward, I, I do think, um, you know, I think energy communities and everything we're doing there is, is a part of a new wave of innovation. So me as a prosumer, I just moved home. My home is not the best place to invest in a PV panel, but I have the money. So just was saying you, some cooperatives require you to commit 200 euro or a thousand. Well, for me, that is not that big of a commitment because the alternative is to put a PV panel on my home, which is not appropriate. So I'm happy to invest in a cooperative model where I can probably for the same amount of money get a more, you know, bigger scale and therefore more in, you know, efficient investment. So I, I do think communities could host people like me, but like Adela said, they are also an opportunity for social innovation. So it would be really, really nice that it's not only for people that can invest a lot, but also um, for more vulnerable consumers. And there, I fully agree with Adela, these kind of anecdotes of certain cities, get local authorities getting involved and maybe even investing on behalf 
of vulnerable consumers and then sharing that investments with them, I think is really the kind of innovation I would like to see more. And as a last point, <laughs> Joss just coined a new term, citizen washing by existing players. Yes, we don't want that. At the same time, I think if you, Joss, your communities could help change the existing players, that can also be positive, right? They should not, I don't know, do things they're claiming they're not do, but if there is genuine change on the existing players, um, which has happened before, right? Uh, retailers started to become more involved in flexibility thanks to independent aggregators pushing them, right, a bit to do this. So I think it's not necessarily bad that some of the existing players adopt some of your good practices. Um, as long as it's not citizen wa uh, washing, then it's okay, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, lessons for all of us going forward. Finally, last but not least, to give the, the final word to Adela. Um, how do you see things going forward? Ten years from now, where will we be? <laughs> well, so I think I would just, um, I would also say um, much more consumer empowerment, much more, many more active uh, consumers, uh, many more diversity of engaging with energy, uh, much more innovation, as Leonardo said, much more like different types of services offered to consumers, um, not just supply of energy, but all sorts of services. So that would be my prediction. <laughs> thank you very much. And, and thanks short, for this very interesting Short, seminar. sweet, and very optimistic. That's fabulous. Thank you, Adela. And that's what we need. Uh, just to thank everybody on the panel, everybody who stayed with us. Um, we went a little bit over time, but it's been very, for me, a very interesting discussion. I hope you also enjoyed and, and took away some real examples, some practical um, cases and some alerts and of how things are, are happening and how things could be happening. So thank you very much to, to everybody. And we continue the discussions. Uh, energy communities are, are here to stay, I'm sure. And there's many more experiences and, and lessons we can draw from them um, after this, the, this boom this initial boom, if you will, and going forward. Thanks very much and wish everybody a very good day and read the study if you haven't already. <laughs>